What's happening, Packer fans? Happy Thursday. Welcome into an all-new episode of the Pack-A-Day podcast. I'm your host, Andy Herman. You can follow me on Twitter at Andy Herman NFL. You can follow the podcast at Pack-A-Day podcast. Thank you so much for being here. Always, always, always appreciate it. We are going to be going over the film review and grades from Packers Broncos, which I know probably sounds a little bit like having a root canal and probably doesn't sound like the most fun thing in the world, but I promise you we will have some positives throughout it to kind of force it down and get it through our system. And of course, we'll go over some of the players who did not play as well either, but there's always some really key takeaways from that. So we'll get to that in just a moment. We've got some huge... Huge might be a little bit much, but we've had a few different transactions that took place on Wednesday. Uh, We also had some key injury updates that we'll get to. But before we get there, if you have not yet had the opportunity to check out Packaday podcast memberships, how about right now? Now would be the perfect time. If you want to support myself and the podcast, it is the perfect way to do so. Four different tiers available, starter, Pro Bowl, All Pro, and Hall of Fame. Uh, whatever might fit your means to be able to support the channel, that they, they are out there. There's a ton of different perks that are available. Members only episode that are commercial free. Uh, we've got live Q and A's every single week that are open to Pro Bowl members and higher only. So there's a lot of different stuff that is available out there that you should definitely check out right now. But enough about that. Let's get into some of those injury updates and transactions. Let's start with injuries. How about we do the bad news first? Let's get that out of our system. From an injury update standpoint, Aaron Jones did not practice. He did not go out with the team. He stretched with the team. Uh, It sounds like Matt LaFleur said, A, he's a little bit sore, but B, that they're hoping to ramp him up this week. We'll see what that means, but this sort of feels like status quo for Aaron, where my guess is he probably ends up playing this week but you probably end up with a limited Aaron Jones again, which is just like living a half-life. And you want that guy to be healthy 100%. I don't think you're in a position where you can sit him out again and hope that he gets healthier. Long. Like he kind of needs to play at this point for Green Bay and they desperately need a win. But it just seems like it's at that spot where you're kind of in no man's land where you keep playing them and it keeps kind of just not getting fully better. But you need to, like, it's like I said, it's just no man's land at this point. Hopefully that can get cleared up as the rest of the week goes along and he can be as close to 100% and good to go for Sunday as possible against Minnesota. Meanwhile, Josh Myers also did not practice. He initially warmed up with the team, looked like he was going to go out, but ultimately did not. So he was also a did not practice on the day. And then Luke Musgrave, who had that huge hit. It's so interesting because if you watch it, because when I went back and I watched the film, Matt Schneidman had already tweeted out that Luke Musgrave was in a walking boot after the game. And I was so confused by it because I'm like, for a variety of reasons, because of course he had like the helmet to helmet hit, which you're thinking like concussion. My initial reaction was like, I wonder if Matt like meant to tweet out that somebody else was in a walking boot, but accidentally said Musgrave, but no, it was Luke Musgrave. If you go back and watch that last play, when he takes the hit, his like ankle like does really go sort of awkward. What threw me is like, he gets up and he's walking around afterwards, just fine on the sidelines. And maybe he was just you know, knocked to the point of not realizing he was in pain. I don't know. I say that like, I'm not meaning to make a joke about it, but I don't know what happened. But like, he's walking around fine. And then of course he ends up being in a walking boot. He is not in concussion protocol. He literally has an ankle injury. So you hate to see that. And he did not practice either. So Aaron Jones, Josh Myers, Luke Musgrave are your Packers who did not practice. Limited participation, Jair Alexander still dealing with the back injury. Hopefully they can get some clarity and and hopefully that just clears up through the course of this week and he's able to play against Minnesota. Jordan Addison, that matchup, it's not Justin Jefferson, Jair Alexander, but Jordan Addison, Jair Alexander would still be really fun and that would be a key player to have for that matchup. Devondre Campbell back practicing. That is a huge get for Green Bay's defense. Isaiah McDuffie has struggled and he is a really nice special teams player. He's one of those players where if he's like your fourth linebacker and he needs to come in in an emergency situation, you're okay. But the amount of snaps that he's had to play is so far less than ideal and getting Devondre back would be a huge, huge win for this defense. Elton Jenkins was limited. We're going to talk about Elton in just a little bit and his struggles. I think it's really important to remember he is still battling an injury and this Elton Jenkins is not 100%. And I think that's a huge reason why we've seen some of the struggles with Elton so far. Yash Nyman was also limited as well as Devontae Wyatt. And then full participants were Zane Anderson and Christian Watson. And the two big ones here, Christian Watson and Devontae Wyatt. 
It has been few and far between on days where we have had any sort of positive injury news, and we still have to take our medicine with the news that Aaron Jones and Luke Musgrave didn't practice and Josh Myers to some extent. But Christian Watson, when you saw that initial injury and he gets to the sideline and collapses, I mean, we're all thinking what, probably at least a couple weeks, three weeks, something. And if not something, maybe even worse than that. And now he's practicing in full on Wednesday. That is a huge, huge win for Green Bay. And the fact that it looks like he's going to be fine, good to go moving forward. It looked like that could have easily been an injury that kept him out some games. And for anyone that's questioning Christian Watson's toughness or anything like that, like after that injury this past week, he easily could have been like, I'll let me just rest it a little bit and I'll see what's happening on Friday. Or maybe he could have just done individual work or just stretched with the team, whatever. He was a full participant out there grinding away. I'm sure he's not 100% following that, but he was out practicing and just great to see Christian back out there. Green Bay's going to need him this week against Minnesota. And then Devontae Wyatt to have a player who was carted off. I mean, what are what are the odds of a player carted off and then practicing at the next play, you know, practice? It's not often. And usually it's much, much, much worse. So the fact that he was carted off, but it was able to practice even in limited capacity on Wednesday, also a huge win for Green Bay. So some good news, Devondre back, Watson practicing, Wyatt practicing, Jair practicing, some bad news, Musgrave, Myers, and Jones not practicing, and we'll get to more bad news in just a moment. But overall, at least a couple positives to take away specifically with Watson and Wyatt. Now, to the other bad news, the first of the two transactions were Eric Stokes and Darnell Savage going on injured reserve. They're going to miss at least four weeks and that's a bummer. That sucks. Like you want those guys out there and for Stokes, it's brutal. And you have this player who fought back from the Liz Frank injury, gets back to about ready to practice from that, suffers a hamstring injury. So then they have, you know, have to keep him on the pup list, comes back from the hamstring injury, plays four snaps of special teams, injures his hamstring again, and now is on injured reserve. So just a brutal blow for him and for Green Bay. And now Green Bay is going to have to wait even longer to get him back out on the field. And, you know, then you also have Darnell Savage who goes on IR. Listen, Savage is playing fast, which you appreciate. The effort is there. It has still been very, very up and down for Darnell. I don't think it's getting better with Jonathan Owens. I think that's probably a step down, but you know, either way, you just want to see Darnell back in with this team. It sucked to see him go down on a non-contact injury this past week. Hopefully he's back sooner rather than later, but Eric Stokes and Darnell Savage officially go to IR. Meanwhile, Corey Ballantyne is activated to the active roster. Paul Brettel called that one yesterday. Uh, he was out of practice squad call-up, so it maybe made some sense uh, that he would be the one that you would call up. He does get the call-up and he will be now on the 53-man roster and active on game days. Meanwhile, they also signed Robert Rochelle off of the Panthers practice squad. He is also a corner, big physical fast corner, former wide receiver. He's an interesting player. Usually, This doesn't mean anything, by the way, but usually when you go practice squad poaching, it's a team like the Eagles or someone like that. It's usually not the worst team in football like the Panthers. Usually the worst team in football, they're, they're if they're a 53-man player, they're already on the roster. It doesn't mean anything at all, but it's just interesting to see. Usually don't poach a practice squad player from the worst team in football, but I digress. Robert Rochelle on the team. He's a fun, interesting player. My guess would be core special teams player, but with Jair battling injury and with Stokes not playing, like that corner room gets pretty thin, pretty fast. You still have Razul. You still have Nixon. You still have Valentine, but now, you know, you've got at least some depth, Corey Ballantyne and Robert Rochelle, if they do need that depth, if Jair is not able to go this week. They also added another corner, Zion Gilbert, former Giants practice squad and uh, training camp player, undrafted free agent. He gets added to the practice squad, taking the place of Corey Ballantyne. So in total, Eric Stokes and Darnell Savage to IR, Corey Ballantyne to the active roster, Robert Rochelle signed from the active roster from the Panthers practice squad, and Zion Gilbert added to the practice squad to take the place of Corey Ballantyne. Any questions? Those are all the transactions and injury updates. I will update you as we receive any more updates or transactions through the course of the week, of course. But until then, let's go through grades and tape review. Let's start off with my top three graded players on offense this week. And number one on that list is Jaden Reed with a plus 0.55 grade. 
The big one, of course, is the touchdown pass. And it's not intended for him. It's a little bit of luck. It's a ball bouncing the right way. But it's still a player that is going through the play, maintaining concentration, and bailing out his teammate who really had a drop on the play, meaning Romeo Dobbs, and finding a way to go get the ball and score a touchdown. A little bit lucky, sure. But sometimes you make your own luck. He's there, he's concentrating, he's watching the ball, and he's able to come down with a touchdown. Also had a, a big first down pickup. Not the crisp, you know, beautiful route that you'd like to see from Jaden on that play, but still is able to pick up a key first down in that game. I thought he blocked relatively well and just overall had a very steady performance. Was it spectacular? No. Was he a game breaker throughout the course of the game? No. But did he do what it was asked of him more often than not? Yes. Were there any major negatives? No. He just had a really nice game, including a touchdown pass off of a ricochet. So it was a nice performance. I think we can even expect to see more from Jaden Reed as a player moving forward, but this is a positive performance and one that I think is continuing to trend in the right direction for their young rookie wide receiver. Meanwhile, number two on my list, another rookie wide receiver, and that is Dontavian Wicks in only 14 snaps. And this is the same theme it feels like every single week. Dontavian Wicks is my second highest graded offensive player on the team this year. And he doesn't have the snap production that so many of the other players on offense do. Like I said, 14 snaps this week is my second highest graded player. He's got the throw to Aaron Jones. It's not the uh, beautiful throw. It's a little bit underthrown, but he also did a great job of adjusting as the coaches mentioned this week where they're expecting to hit that down the field, but Simmons read it well. So he has to throw it short and he made a great adjustment on it to throw it short and to make sure that he could still complete that pass to Aaron Jones. He's got the big first down catch over the middle where he goes up, skies, gets the ball, gets down on the ground, makes somebody miss and gets up field. We just haven't seen that. And then there's a big uh, first down. I think it was a first down run to Aaron Jones where Jones gets to the outside where Wicks is blocking his guy, you know, is the, the corner into oblivion along the sidelines. That This is the stuff that you see every single week, even when he's not getting the ball. Tenacious blocker. He's got great route running ability. He's got good hands. He's got some run after the catch. I've said it all week. I'll say it again. We need to see more of Dontavian Wicks. I don't care how you have to get there. There there should be, and just let's be totally clear. There should be zero Malik Heath or some more A2A snaps at this point. Every open wide receiver snap that's available should go to Christian Watson, Romeo Dobbs, Jaden Reed, or Dontavian Wicks. Every time, unless they're hurt or they're getting a breather or they can't go in and you need to put in two race, fine, so be it. But there should not be any planned Samori Toure. And that's not even a disrespect to Samori Toure. It's just how much I think of those top four wide receivers and they're just better at this point. So this week it was 14 snaps for uh, Dontavian Wicks and seven for Samori Toure. At minimum, at minimum, that needs to be 21 snaps for Dontavian Wicks. And I think he even needs to play more than that. Now, if he gets a more you know, involved in the offense. And if he gets more snaps and he doesn't make the most of them, or he just isn't able to handle it, then fine. So be it. Then we can course correct. But right now he's playing far too well and is one of the real bright spots of this team in very limited playing time that now needs to see more and more extensive playing time to see if he can continue to be a playmaker the more that he is on the field. Number three is a very familiar face for the offensive top grades. That is Zach Tom, plus 0.45, my highest graded offensive player on the year. He's having a fantastic season. I, what I would kind of say about Jaden Reed is not a perfect game from Tom, but a really nice game, solid in run blocking, solid in pass protection. There's no big standout plays. There's usually not going to be for an offensive tackle, especially for Zach Tom, who's not like this mauler. He's not throwing guys to the round. He's not ground. He's not pancaking people, easy for me to say. But he's overall a fantastic blocker. He's getting the job done. And what really complicates things here is I think there is some want and desire to maybe move Zach Tom around and maybe get some of the other guys off the field. Maybe you do put Yash in at right tackle and try some things. It's just so hard because he's playing so well at right tackle and there's just not much that's going well for Green Bay that it makes it really hard to potentially break something with Zach Tom that's going so well at right tackle just to try to fix some other things. The good news is he played, a, what, four snaps at center, and he looked really good at center in those four snaps. I think he can be good in a lot of different places. They're going to have to figure out where that works best, but I would still be so hesitant to move him at this point just because he is a really, really good right tackle right now, and there's just not much going right for Green Bay. My bottom three offensive players, Rasheed Walker, negative 1.35 grade, 
By the way, check out the full grades over at PackerReport.com if you want an explanation as to how I grade, also over on PackerReport.com. But Rashid Walker, negative 1.35, really tough week. There are snaps where you watch Rashid Walker, especially as a pass blocker, and you're like, okay, I can see it. I can see what a finished product of Rashid Walker looks like, and I can see that you want to keep going in that direction with him, hoping that he can develop over time. But it is so insanely inconsistent right now. There's a play where he just gets jackknifed right back into the quarterback. I think he also got called for a holding penalty on the play. It's just, it's ugly. It's really ugly. And what I've said is like, people are wondering why Rashid Walker over Yash Nyman. And here's kind of what I've said. Going, and there was clearly something that happened because of that, you know, when Adam Stenovich was asked about him in training camp and gave kind of that scathing response about Nyman, and then LaFleur kind of backtracked it the next day and said they had a lot of faith in him. Whatever the case may be, my vantage point was that Rashid very much outplayed Yash in training camp. I also thought Rashid easily outperformed Yash in the preseason. However, we have a body of work for Yash in games. We now have a, uh, what, five-game body of work for Rashid Walker in games? That five-game body of work for Rashid Walker is just flat-out bad. And while I have been probably the leader of the Yash is overrated, you you know, a lot of people think he's just the starting tackle. He's not. He's a swing tackle at best. I, like, I've been very clear and adamant about that over time. I al- will also say Yash in regular season games is far above what we've seen from Rashid Walker so far. So it's great that Rashid had the better camp. It's great that Rashid had the better, uh, you know, preseason. It's great that Rashid's under contract moving forward and is younger and has better, you know, upside and developmental traits than Yash. But if you look at just their body of work in regular season games, Yash, not too shabby, even though not great, not good, not as good as people think, but not not awful. Rashid's pretty freaking awful. So in my opinion, yes, as much as I'd like to see Rashid continue to grow, it's probably time to make that switch and put Yash at left tackle and see if he can just be an upgrade at this point. Although I will say this, Yash comes in for what, four snaps in this game when Tom moved into center, when Myers went out, Yash immediately allow, or like has a really bad run block that goes for a a tackle on the running back. So he had four plays. One of them was a big negative, you know, it, all of the offensive linemen need to be better, who's ever in there, and there's no silver bullet that's just going to fix everything. Speaking of which, Elton Jenkins, my second lowest graded player on offense this week, negative 0.8 grade, had a really bad block early in the game. He has the holding penalty later. There's another play in the middle of the game where he completely misses a, uh, an assignment. And, and great chat with Sam Monson yesterday. If you didn't check that out, definitely do so. He brought up a great point of like, you can very much tell from an athletic standpoint that Elton just doesn't look right. And he's totally right. And he's totally fair in that assessment. And it's just a good reminder to me too, of like, it's so easy to be like, Elton's in the game. That's Elton Jenkins. But we forget sometimes that he's been fighting injury for the past few weeks and that he's not hundred percent and that he didn't practice all throughout the week. And when you don't practice, it really makes some of the things that you do, especially from a fundamental standpoint, really hard to make right when you're actually in the game and just have that muscle memory of all the things that you practice during the week. You could see that with Elton this week. He struggled. One of his, like, there have been times where he's had bad games, specifically like at right tackle or when he moves to a different position, but it's not very often he has a bad game, specifically at left guard. This is a bad game at left guard, and you can tell his injuries are really bothering him, and he's just not 100% at the moment. The next lowest one is another offensive lineman. John Runyon Jr., negative 0.55. Runyon's been extremely disappointing, so inconsistent. The run blocking has been brutal. He's an okay pass protector. He really is, but the run blocking is just so bad that it's really hard for his okay pass protection to make up for brutal, brutal run blocking. And I don't know if you make a swap there or try to make a change. I've liked running in the past, but he has consistently gotten worse, which has been a trend for so many of these offensive linemen over the course of the past few seasons. I'm not sure. Like he just needs to play better. He's on a contract year. Like he is, he's going out for his next contract every single time he's out on the field. I just want to see him play a much more consistent brand of football. We haven't seen that from Runyon and it's been super, super disappointing. 
And I, like it's just been that way all season long, which just absolutely sucks. My lowest graded, my lowest graded player on the season, offense or defense, John Running Jr. Would not have expected that coming into the year, but that's where we are, and it definitely needs to be better. Some other noteworthy ones on offense: Jordan Love, negative zero point three five grade. I had a passable grade on Jordan and a positive grade on Jordan up until the final two throws. Was it great? No, not even close. Really bad throw on the the touchdown pass where Dobbs went up and basically intercepted it from Patrick Sertan. But overall, I thought he still had a slight positive grade and more kind of in that neutral passable grade, if you will, not helping his team to victory, but not really making the mistakes that would lose the game either. Just kind of the same as a lot of what else is going on in the team where he's making a couple of mistakes here and there, but everyone around him is screwing up probably worse. That's where we're kind of at. But then those last two throws, the throw to Watson where he misses and it ends up injuring Christian on the play and was just late to it. And then of course the interception at the end where he just underthrew it and undercooked it in a very severe way. Those are mistakes that can't happen, especially with the game on the line. And that dropped it into a negative. Aaron Jones and AJ Dillon plus 0.4 grades, both really nice performances. You would love if Jones could just stay in there and just stay healthy just because he's so integral to the offense, but both had solid days. Tucker Craft, his best day, plus 0.35. Thought he did a really nice job as a blocker, and you could see legitimate improvement from him in this game. And then Josh Myers, somebody that I have been, oh, how do I want to say? Negative is the wrong word, but I think realistic and just it hasn't been performing well. I've been, I've been a critic of Josh Myers. I'll put it that way. Plus 0.25 grade for Josh Myers this week. I thought he had a more than passable performance. Nice day. Some mistakes still, some things you'd like to get cleaned up, but he came back from the injury, gutted through it, and overall had a very solid performance this week, which hopefully, fingers crossed, that can be something that he can build on moving forward. Still a young player, even though he's in year three, still a young player. You never know when the light bulb might go off. I'm not saying he had a light bulb going off moment this week, but at least it was better and a little bit more consistent than what we've seen in the past from Josh Myers. Top three defensive performers, Rashawn Gary plus 0.4. The the pass rush win rate was awesome again. I think PFF had him at 40%, which is just incredible. Two out of every five pass plays he's getting to the quarterback. No big plays, no strips, no sacks, no forced fumbles, no fumble recoveries, no interceptions, nothing like that. But his presence was felt, thought he was better against the run this week, and he continues to play more and more snaps and make more and more of an impact. So nice day for Rashawn Gary again. Kingsley Nigbari, his best game by far of the year. He's really, really struggled. This was so much better. Stayed home on the edge a little bit better. I thought he was better as a pass rusher, got back in the backfield on a couple different occasions. Just a really nice step in the right direction from Kingsley. And then Colby Wooden plus 0.2. I'm going to be totally honest off the top of my head. I can't remember any of the the Colby Wooden plays that stood out in this one, Uh, but just a a nice performance. Thought he did well against the run. I think he did have one play where he kind of jackknifed into the backfield a little bit, but overall nice performance from Colby Wooden. And he's a player that they could very much use trending in the right direction. Hasn't had a great year so far. Not totally unexpected for a little bit of an undersized defensive lineman that's a day three pick and trying to get in the rotation. This was a step in the right direction and a positive performance for Colby Wooden. My bottom three defensive players, Keyshawn Nixon, negative 0.9, multiple missed tackles, had a couple opportunities in the backfield that he missed, had a play where Russell Wilson scrambled and Nixon completely whiffed on him really tough and then not really making up for it in coverage as well. Had a couple tough plays in in pass uh, coverage. It's just been a really tough season as a corner for Nixon. The the issue is there's not really many other options, especially with Jair being out and Stokes now going back on IR. He's going to be the nickel guy probably for the rest of the season. Maybe they could call up an Ennis Gaines and give him a handful of snaps inside. I'm not sure that's going to be any better. So right now that is his job. It just needs to be much better, especially from a tackling standpoint. Isaiah McDuffie, we kind of talked about earlier, negative 0.6 grade, all over the place and not in a good way. Miss some like miss some gaps, couldn't get off some blocks, missed some tackles, just insanely inconsistent from Isaiah McDuffie. And then Carrington Valentine, negative 0.45. I think people probably would have expected this one to be a little bit worse. There were some positives on tape from Valentine as well. He was aggressive coming up in the run game. He also had a couple plays where he was tight in coverage, but he also gave up at least three first down completions 
They picked on him early. He got better as the game went along. Still a negative performance with a negative 0.45 grade for Carrington Valentine. Some other quick ones. You had Brenton Cox with a plus 0.15. Probably only played three or four snaps, but did a really nice job of setting the edge on one play and did a really nice job of getting a, a pressure on another play. He, lo he looked good. He looked physical. He looked fast. I was impressed. And I kind of want to see a little bit more of Brenton Cox now, if I'm being honest. So plus 0.15. Quay Walker, negative 0.35. Another player where you could tell just wasn't 100%, didn't have his normal game that he's been having so far this season. The one thing I will caution, I've seen some people say Quay has made this huge jump and he is now easily earning of that first round pick and he's on par to become a really great inside linebacker. I do believe Quay has taken a significant step. I do think he is much better than he was a season ago. I do think he is progressing to pay, like helping to pay off that first round pick that they used on him. I still think Quay has a lot to work on. I think he still needs to be a lot more physical. You will see him miss some tackles from time to time. He had the play where he like had a, kind of the arm up top and the, the running back was, I think it was a running back was able to break out of it. Had another play where he had a player right in the box. And I think it was McLaughlin juked him and got it inside on him. There's just some plays like that injured or not, even throughout the season when he's been healthy, that he still needs to do a much better job of. Progressing better, like what I see out of Quay. Really like what I see out of Quay, but it's not quite there yet. There is still a lot of growth available for Quay Walker, which is a good thing. He can still grow a ton. I don't think he's going to stop getting better anytime soon. And we just need to see more and more of those flashes and hopefully some more big plays moving forward. That is my full list. So just to recap, top three offensive graded players, Jaden Reed, Dontavian Wicks, and Zach Tom. Bottom three offense, Rashid Walker, Elton Jenkins, and John Runyon Jr. Top three defense, Rashawn Gary, Kingsley Nigbari, and Colby Wooden. Bottom three, Keyshawn Nixon, Isaiah McDuffie, and Carrington Valentine. Shout out to our Hall of Fame and All-Pro members, Most Hated Minnesotan, PJ Wynn, John Wild, Shea Broadad, Arnaldo Espinoza, Jennifer Wright, Boom Handle, Lori Lord, and Donald Lee. Thank you guys so much. If you didn't catch Packaday Podcast Live, Great, great chat with Camille Davis and Aaron Nagler. You will want to check that out. Did an episode yesterday with Sam Monson. That is a really fun episode you're going to want to catch. And then coming up, we've got uh, Mike Wall coming up. We've got Luke Braun from Locked On Vikings, which should be a really good chat. That should air on Saturday. Um, we've got a ton of really fun stuff coming up, so make sure not to miss it. I'll be back here soon, but until next time, and as always, go Paco.